Greg? Hi, Greg. May you hear me? Hi, Daniela. Yeah, we hear you fine. Uh, how are you? Is this okay? Yeah, things are good. 0055. Hi, Simon. Hi. Okay, thanks. Yep. Hi, Greg. Hi, Simon. Good afternoon. Hello. You are ready to continue? Yeah, I think I'm ready. <laughs> So we are ready. You are also ready? Uh, yeah, I think ready as we'll ever be. I think so. <laughs> okay, so uh, Alessandro, are you going to make a small introduction or would you like me to? Or? Uh, we are going to an introduction or maybe Greg can do that. Greg, you can do the introduction. Proceed, go on. Okay. Okay, so, um, well, thank you for uh, coming to the thesis defense of Daniele Alami. This is a culmination of uh, a lot of work on a couple of very interesting uh, types of projects, really. Uh, structural geology study as well as uh, some uh, um, numerical modeling of uh, fault volcano interaction. So they're really... Uh, a couple of pretty big topics here that Daniele has covered, probably uh, partly because uh, his two advisors have pulled him a little bit in different directions, but he's done a good job, I think, uh, in the end of managing to um, tie, tie these things together. So um, I should say, too, that uh, Daniele is one of the first uh, the participants in the Invoke program, which now has many students. Um, and um, so he had to work through a number of the kinks in the system. Um, and still getting used to, I think, getting uh, his thesis through our system as well as the, the different requirements and all of these things. So there are a lot of uh, hassles associated with this. But I hope in the end it's all worthwhile. Uh, so that's, that's enough of an introduction. I'll let uh, Daniele take it away. I'm going to mute our microphone and, um, and then we'll have, I guess, questions afterward uh, when you're finished. All right. Okay. So thank you, Greg, for the introduction, <laughs> and good morning to everyone, and thank you for coming and for the participation. My name is Daniela Lamy, and today I'm going to present you a report focusing exactly on the interaction between principal regional tectonic, tectonic activity and volcanism in Ecuador. To approach uh, to this work uh, and finally have uh, some results, uh, I follow um, different steps. And they are, for first, I try to find new and old field ev evidences along the road running from Lamboki village to La Bonita village, and then, um, and then try to interpret those as new segments of older poles or independent sets. Um, to enforce the study, I also want to climb the volcano and just uh, to look it out and try to find the evidence of uh, dikes and treasure to better define the, um, the shape and the, um, the shape of the magmatic chamber and um, how uh, the, the magma can be distributed on the edifice. Um, the next and the last and the last steps was um, elaborate all the data I have collected with a, a, a plugin for MATLAB called Coulomb 3.2. Uh, but all these uh, technical aspects uh, mm, are going to discuss it later. Um, now uh, I want you to have a step back, have a step back with me. Uh, and give uh, and give your attention um, to why why this study uh, took my attention so bad. Uh, we already know from past studies uh, that volcanism is better promoting an extensional tectonic contest, but also recent studies um, have been revealed. Um, also, the compression of tectonic regime uh, uh, could be able to develop uh, volcanism. And um, to describe how 
Uh, I want to start uh, for first with the tectonic history of Ecuador. Um, Daniel, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Dan, but we've lost the video feed from your uh, oh, presentation. Sorry. Is there well, a way to? You have been lost. We, we can't. We can't see your uh, screen at all anymore. Your presentation. Ah, you all Simon and I can. I don't know see why. Slides. You can't see the slides. No, they just disappeared. I don't know. Someone could help me. Now. Sorry, <laughs> we have technical problem here. Uh, the technician tell me you have changed the layout or something about. Is it possible? Greg. Does anybody have? Oh, okay. Are you in? Yeah. Yeah, we're good so, now. Thank you. Can you see the screen? We can. Yep. So you see the presentation going on or Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, perfect. So we were stopping at when I talking about the tectonic history of Ventador, I guess, or something in, something like this. When did you miss the connection? That's that's fine, just pick up where you left off. It's okay. All right, okay. So we were talking about the, um, the tectonic history of Ecuador and uh, why it's so important um, to going on uh, with this project. Um, Ecuador is uh, reasonable located on um, a compressional tectonic uh, situation. And um, this is the starting point uh, when I focus my attention. Uh, Ecuadorian margin, in fact, uh, um, represent a region of intense crustal deformation, uh, which is related to the subduction of the oceanic Nazca plate beneath the continental South American plate along a north 90 degrees uh, striking direction with, um, a total rate, um, with a total rate of movement uh, about 58 millimeters per year. And the Nazca plate um, at this oblique uh, direction, um, the Nazca plate and um, its oblique, um, su oblique subduction uh, give the, um, respect to this margin, give uh, the, um, give the, give the force to promote uh, um, also strike slip folds. Uh, um, along a subduction trench, uh, in adding with uh, all the typical structures of a compression and tectonic subduction zone. And um, this uh, oblique uh, subduction of this Nazca plate is um, related particularly on the fission of the Farallon plate uh, about 20 million years ago. The fission of the, um, the Farallon plate creates two, uh, two different minor plates, the Nazca plate and the Caucus plate, um, and they have uh, two, um, and they have two different direction of subduction uh, beneath the South American margin. Um, this uh, this fission promote the opening of the Cocos Nazca ridge, and um, also this uh, this new ridge promote uh, the opening of another smaller ridge uh, called Carnage Ridge. This smallest ridge is uh, more important for um, our study because um, it seems to extend like mm, 1,000 kilometers from the Galapagos Islands um, to the Colombian-Ecuador trench limit. 
and um, these interpreted and inferred continue beneath uh, the northern Ecuador for about 700 kilometers. Um, this, um, this continuation uh, of the, of the Car carnage ridge beaten beneath the, the South American plate is despite by the, author, by the authors because um, some people um, arguing the, um, the extension of this ridge into the South American, beneath the South American plate is no longer more than 60 kilometers. Anyway, that could help us to um, interpret the role of the Carnage Ridge in the tectonic uh, um, regime in, in Ecuador. Um, this ridge is consisting um, of a thickened oceanic crust. And this, this thickness is various from 13 to 19 kilometers, and um, and the age estimated is about 11 and 20 million years ago. Uh, but more than other things, uh, the um, the creation of this this new ridge uh, had an important role of the tectonic uh, and the seismicity in the northern part of Ecuador. That's why. That's why it's so interesting for us because um, I can argue um, the opening of this ridge could uh, change in some way um, the basic tectonic uh, in this compressional regime, create uh, the um, create the promotion of um, strike slip movement. Uh, on the trusting fault. Um, if you look, if you look here, you can see why I'm able to see that, to to say that. And this is um, the red cycle. The red cycle area is the studied area in Ecuador. I I look it up, and this covered red triangle is the Erementador volcano. And uh, these yellow dots are mm, the epicenter of different uh, seismic events occurred in present time, historic time. And as you can see, there is the exists a big correlation with the, with the major seismicity mm, measured or inferred for the um, for the carnage ridge. So that's why we argue the carnage ridge had an important role on the movement of these faults, or at least why those epicenter are concentrated here. Also, um, further the regional all the regional tectonic situation is important to highlight uh, also the local tectonic situation. Um, and what I mean is um, not just, uh, not just the, the regional thrust faults or strike slip faults could have a big influence on the, on the volcano, but also all the nearby faults surrounded the area around uh, the study elements. Um, in this area, in fact, there are a lot of uh, minor faults, and and they could intact the edifice in different ways. Sometimes they could be very catastrophic, or at least intact the edifice in an important way. Um, to elaborate uh, all my project, uh, I want to take it in account just um, all uh, the faults have had recent movements uh, in the place of scene all of in time, or um, we should have some movements during the um, glacial um, during the glacial period. Um, Analyzing all this, uh, analyzing all this data, uh, it was um, 
it was easy to to divide this part of Ecuador in two big uh, tectonic uh, zones. Um, one located in the eastern part of the Rio Cordillera, and one distributed along uh, all the, the subandean zone, like uh, you can see in this figure here, between these two big truss faults. We have the Rio Cordillera, and here, where there is the last truss fault, we have the subandean zone. Mm. In the first um, in the first zone, which is comprising in the Rio Cordillera, the major the major active and important faults is the Cayambe Chingap fault, uh, which is at an extension of seven kilometers long. Um, along a north-northeast uh, direction. And the field evidence uh, permit us to establish, uh, um, to establish a total movement of these faults about, uh, of this fault about 360 meters in the last 20, 27,000 years. In, inside, in, inside the second zone, which is comprising in the subandean zone, the um, the, the structures have um, a less space continuity and a minor long, longitude, but all the accentuated morphological expression um, suggests that these faults are a superficial expression of a depth complex seismogenetic structures represented um, in this case by the Real Cordillera principal trust upon the Precambrian pavement of the Escudo Guayanense trust characteristic of this part of Ecuador. Um, in history time, all these features we, we described um, are now reactivated with a right lateral strike slip component. And um, this is confirmed also by the field evidences and also by the um, analysis of the 5th March 1987 uh, earthquake, um, which was one of the biggest earthquake uh, shock of this region in the history time. The magnitude of this, uh, of this earthquake was 7.0 um, on, on the scale, and the effects, um, the effects of the earthquake uh, covered a very big area with a um, 60 kilometer extension in a northeast direction and a 30 kilometers wide. Um, the maximum concentration of the effects of the of this earthquake was uh, in the um, in the area between El Reventador Volcano and the Rio Salado zone, which is here, where I have the mouse and. Um, the shock uh, mm, just affected the Paleozoic and the Precambrian unit of the Rio Cordillera and the um, volcanic deposit by Elementador Volcano. Um, all of this information gave us the possibility, give us the possibility to infer this, uh, infer this region is going to under a compressive tectonic uh, statement and um, with an east-west direction, with a principal direction of the horizontal compressional axis uh, about east-west, more or less. And um, with sometimes, uh, with, which sometimes striking east, uh, northeast, uh, west, southwest, with um, producing an, an oblique movement uh, a little far from the principal trust mm, we, we, have, we have to consider. Uh, also, the power of this earthquake was characterized uh, by the movement of minor structures uh, in the area, supported by the analysis of the seismicity and micro seismicity. One month later, this earthquake had been occurred. So, mm, this was the tectonic situation where our volcano, um, Air Aventador volcano, object of the study, um, is situated. And so, mm, 
Now uh, we are going through the analysis of um, the volcano itself and um, try to find out which is the correlation between this tectonic situation in the northern part of uh, the northern part of Ecuador and this particular volcano. I picked up this volcano because I have different reasons for picking up this volcano. And the first uh, is um, this was uh, the first uh, volcano I have uh, I heard it and study in a compressional tectonic uh, regime, and and it's still active. So I think uh, it's a good idea to try to uh, explain better. Um, the behavior of this volcano relate in relation also with the tectonic situation affect uh, Ecuador. For a second, is um, is a poorly studied volcano. Even though um, it is located not far from the capital city of Ecuador, Quito, and also is surrounded uh, is completely surrounded by small and poor village where the people um, doesn't know anything about volcanic risk and nobody could help it, them out to figure it out what what they can do when this volcano had a, a very explosive or dangerous um, activity. And for, for third, um, it is included in a, in a very big regional park in this region of Ecuador. Uh, which is, could be the destination for many tourists, uh, for for many tourists, and the and knows better the behavior of this volcano could help to prevent every kind of risk or whatever other situation uh, in this part of uh, of the Ecuadorian zone. Mm. This volcano is, um, a is a huge late quaternary stratovolcano um, and it started to grow up uh, 0.32 million years ago and at an average diameter of 14 kilometers and this age is uh, 3,562 meters above sea level. And the particular of this volcano is a uh, its substrate outcrops at <laughs> 1,800 uh, meters above sea level. Uh, since its creation, this volcano alternates moments of rest and period and period of intense magmatic activity, uh, with the restart emission sometime in a catastrophic way, like what happened in uh, the 2000 in the November of 2002 when the Reventador. Um, starting to starting the emission again after a, um, more than 20 years period of rest. And um, why and um, why and how the the magmatic uh, um, why and how the um, the volcano are able to um, to remain active in a compressional tectonic regime, which is, uh, like I said before, which is not favor not favorable favorable for the um, for the magmatic activity. Um, recent uh, recent study um, carry, carried out um, a good answer for that and. Um, So, <laughs> and um, it is describing these two figures. Uh, if we took, um, we know um, beneath the Reventador, um, the big thrust, the, the big rear cordillera thrust is uh, still active, and the uh, Reventador will kind of grow it up on uh, this thrust. The movement of this thrust um, at some uh, interaction with the with the edifice, uh, like as you see on the left with this figure, 
um, the movement uh, of, um, of, a of a big reverse fault uh, could uh, develop two different minor folds inside the edifice itself. The F1 folds, which created by this movement, is a, is a normal fault um, and is uh, argued to promote the, ascend the, the ascending of the, of the magma from, uh, to the surface. And the F2 is a reverse, is a thrust fault or a reverse fault. Uh, which works like an accommodation fault for uh, the big, a, a probably big collapse of the flank of the volcano. Um, in fact, Reventador in his in his history in its history had, um, was affected by two um, two flank collapse. And um, this plan collapse, this plan collapse um, seems to play a fundamental role for the for the ascending of the magma to the surface. Um, unfortunately, the evidence of the presence of these faults are covered by the, the more the more recent lava flows and uh, pyroclastic flows occurred during. Uh, the last decades, and um, that's why we're using this analog model to try to explain um, how the magma can reach the surface and how the flank collapse works to create a very big explosion like the to the November two thousand two, where occurred uh, at the at the volcano. Um, but um, how can we link this, um, these two characteristics of this part of the world, especially the northern part of Ecuador? Um, like as you see in this figure on the right, uh, we have uh, the, seism the seismicity collective uh, by the analysis of uh, focal mechanism uh, produced by the movement of the real caldera big thrust, but also this seismicity uh, could be can be related uh, to the presence of a magmatic chamber cutted by the by the thrust. To, um, to, support this, um, to support this hypothesis, um, I, um, I found uh, a study by Samenego and other authors about, uh, the, um, about the analysis of the lava flows from um, Ereventador volcano from the, the from two big eruptive events, uh, which are the November 2002 explosive, big explosive event and the consequent 2005, 2005 more explosive events. Mm. The, the author, mm, through the analysis of these lava flows, uh, were able to define the existence of an andesitic uh, magma body located near the surface between 7 and 12 kilometers, um, frequently intruded by more hydrous magma from, deeper, from a deeper source. In this figure, you can see the differentiation of uh, the zone dresser of the superficial reservoir and the, uh, the in, intruding of the more uh, hydrous magma body and the consequent mixing of the magma and um, uh, and the incipient differenti differentiation uh, caused by this um, by this intruding. Um, 
the analysis between the 2002 and 2005 um, eruptive activity uh, shows uh, and suggests uh, are pretty similar and show and suggest uh, this mechanism is pretty common in this part uh, of Ecuador and especially in on this volcano. Uh, since uh, the Ereventador um, have uh, a period of rest very long respect uh, all the other situation occurred in its history uh, since 1976 to, to November 2002. Um, I want to try to I want to try to combine all this knowledge um, to, the, the, to develop uh, a model uh, simulating the 5th March 1987 um, earthquake and see um, which was uh, the effect of this earthquake on the magmatic of the supposed magmatic chamber of this volcano and uh, the effect on the eruptive history, uh, obviously, of this volcano. Um, to do that, um, I used a software called Coulomb, uh, which is a, a plug, it's more a plugin for, for MATLAB, uh, and um, it, was the, it, it is developed by the USGS, by um, Lean, Stain, and Sinji Toda. Um, with this software, we are able to to reproduce um, earthquakes and uh, see um, what change and see what are the changes um, and the effect of the earth, of these earthquakes on the regional normal of the regional norm on the regional local normal stress and shear stress changes. Um, in fact. Uh, uh, through this uh, numerical modeling, is possible to to see uh, if after the movement of specific structures, uh, the normal stress change increase or decrease, promoted clamping or clamping. So, um, to be more um, to be more specific, if uh, um, there is a, a subdivision been after this earthquake uh, or after this movement of the fault um, between uh, the um, a compressional or extensional um, result um, near this fault. Um, to do that, um, to do that and see if uh, some movements or um, some movements or some folds or um, <laughs> uh, I based uh, this uh, modeling on the previously mapped um, structures and um, for first I taken in account just only the quaternary folds uh, not distant more than 100 kilometers from the volcano and uh, only the falls have uh, a strike slip or a reverse component because those are the two uh, biggest tectonic regime acting in this part of Ecuador. And, um, and the falls I, taking, I took in account uh, uh, were the Cayambe Chingal Falls, which, were, which was described before, the Reventador Fault, which is um, a very important fault, um, fault um, affect the entire edifice of Reventador with uh, some consequence uh, with, it, with its movement, and the Sumaco Fault and the Cascade Fault. Um, also, these faults were taken in account because all of those uh, uh, were um, have suffered the reactivation after the 5th March 1987 earthquake. And so, um, and for this reason, um, 
and for future uh, development of this work, I choose to pick it up. Uh, all that faults um, could be reasonable, um, able to um, have some effects on the volcano, on the Reventador volcano. Mm, I create two different, like as you see in this figure, I create two different scenario uh, for each fault. Um, one uh, is, uh, mm, one simulates um, the structure if uh, it has uh, a, a deep inclination about 45, 45 degrees and um, treated like um, a reverse fault and on the right we have the scenario when the, the fault is treated like a um, more slightly fault with some reverse component. And um, here, for example, we have the Chinga fault and what we could see, this fault on the volcano promotes the unclamping. So we have a decreasing of the normal stress uh, beneath the volcano, which is not able to promote any eruption. Um, On the opposite, um, we can see here, for example, the Reventador fault and its movement, treating it like a truss fault or a strike slip fault, um, promote an increasing of the normal stress change. So um, in this way, um, probably in the Reventador volcano could be a fact of the um, could be a fact of the of the movement uh, of this fault to when it's going to be when it's going to erupt. And the same uh, is for the Sumac and the same is uh, for the Sumaco fault. Um, this um, This mechanism is better ex um, explained in, in this image uh, um, from Walter and, and Amelung uh, uh, paper, where um, we can see um, the volumetric expansion, so um, the dilatation promoted by um, an increasing of the normal stress change uh, on the magmatic chamber could promote the eruption. Uh, but the most interesting part uh, is related to what happened between the 1976 and the 2002 when we have this long period of rest uh, for this volcano. Um, since the volcano needs uh, um, Since the volcano needs to be um, intruded by uh, another, another kind of um, deeper magma source, um, we, could, we could argue um, after the 1970, 1976, probably the volcano was uh, in a period of um, little rest uh, because uh, the magmatic chamber obviously <laughs> need time to recharge itself, so uh, probably we have the ascending of the magma from the deeper source through the, the shallow magmatic chamber and just starting to create the condition for a new eruption. But in the 1987, uh, more close uh, with, the, um, with the time expected for another eruption uh, because the time of rest of Erevantador is uh, have an average of 15 years. Um, the 5th March 1987 earthquake occurred. And uh, we, we see uh, after this, uh, after this, um, this earthquake had been occurred, um, the, um, the zone beneath, uh, beneath the, um, the volcano and uh, the magmatic chamber supposed uh, 
by Samianego um, was particular because um, we have a, the epicenter of the, the earthquake is here when I have the mouse because the star represents the epicenter is disappeared and I don't know why. And uh, we have a four different parts when the, the sine plus represent uh, dilatation and the sine minus represent contraction. So what we can see is after the um, after the fifth March uh, 1987 earthquake, we have a big area of dilatation beneath the beneath the shallow magmatic chamber, but um, mm. linked to the deeper reservoir, we have a very big area of contraction. So what I want what I'm going to infer is uh, this earthquake uh, in the opposite of what we expect, so earthquake promotes eruption. In this particular situation, probably this, er this earthquake <coughs> stopped the, the passage of the, the, the ascending of the magma from the, from the deeper reservoir to the shallow magmatic chamber. And this and this stop in the activity um, could be mean uh, the magma in the shallow magmatic chamber was not mixed uh, enough, and we and probably not reached in gas like uh, for the others uh, magmatic event to be able to asc to ascending more and uh, um, express itself in another um, eruptive event. Um, after that, uh, obviously, in time, uh, the dilatation and the con and the contraction uh, beneath the between these two magmatic chamber um, going to be less, and then the magma could ascend and mixing better and uh, enrich it more and more and more in gas. And that's why I think um, in the November 2002, the Reventador started again is eruptive um, activity with a very violent big explosion. Uh, in conclusion, uh, what we see um, is, uh, the, is pretty much all the quaternary faults um, are able to induce um, increasing of the normal stress change, but um, they are probably not um, enough um, strong to influence the, um, the magmatic activity. activity. In fact, uh, during uh, history time, um, th those faults um, have some movements, but they, these movements not influenced at all the period of rest and unrest of the of this volcano itself. And um, despite that, uh, the more important um, effect uh, we could see on this volcano by the tectonic situation is, um, is the one about the 5th March 1997 earthquake, which is um, Because the situation um, was uh, enforced uh, with, um, by the very long period of rest of the volcano and uh, the occurrence of this earthquake uh, so close to the, to the ending of the period of rest of this volcano when we expected, we, when, when we expect another uh, effusive or quiet explosive eruption. Uh, by this work, mm, so this work was more a report <coughs> than, than a real thesis work. What I mean is, uh, um, what I try to do is uh, collect uh, all the information we have about this 
uh, not well studied part of the world and try to figure it out uh, what problems we could have uh, analyzing um, tectonic system and volcanism uh, included in, uh, in, the same, uh, in the same area. Uh, so for, um, for the future, uh, future goals this uh, work uh, proposed is uh, an improved and more complete study of the area to have the possibility to obtain more information about uh, the tectonic movement and, um, and the characteristic and geometric and kinematics uh, of the poles present there. Um, a new and more deeper analysis of the lava flows and the dikes on the volcano uh, could give us uh, other uh, and more specific indication about depth and shape of the magmatic chamber, and in this way we have the, and in this way we could have the possibility to um, complicate our model and try to to be more detailed uh, when we want to model and a situation to see uh, which is the progression of that in the future. And um, for the last, uh, I think uh, this uh, kind of uh, analysis um, could be helpful not only for these uh, poorly studied cases, but also for all the more complete um, examples in the world uh, um, of volcano in a compressional tectonic uh, regime. And that's it. Okay, I think that you can start to make the first questions and then the ending I will give my questions to Daniele. I give I hello to Bill also. Hi Bill. Right. Hi Bill. <laughs> So now, now the questions are up to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you guys want to begin? Or? Do, we, do we have an, exa an oral exam afterwards as well, Alessandro? Or? Pardon? How does it work? Do, do, we, do, do we have an exam with uh, um, Daniele afterwards as well? Or is this the period of oral examination right now? Right now, I think. So, Daniele, you uh, in your thesis, you have there's a lot of there's a large section about the field work you did. Yeah. So, but you didn't mention that much in your presentation. Uh, did, yeah. Uh, uh, can you describe uh, how that was important or what you discovered from that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I just have uh, I skip it there because uh, I <laughs> just was uh, in a rush with the discussion about uh, all the all the link between the stuff. So uh, yeah, in the field uh, we have um, we decide to pick it up some specific faults also by the field results we obtained when we are going when we went to the in Ecuador to analyze the tectonic situation and what. We found um, along this new road uh, from which running from Lambaki village in the south to the La Bonita village more close to the Colombian border. Um, we found uh, here you can see the three more important um, outcrops uh, we found there. And um, about uh, analyzing uh, those outcrops, uh, we found a strictly relation with the um, with the old faults. Sorry, already analyzed by other authors and by a lot of bibliography. So um, we suppose um, by the cinematic and the, geom and the geometry of this on this fault and these traces. Um, these are the continue of uh, 
they could represent um, the, um, the continue of these folds uh, all along into the Colombian border too. And um, this evidence helped, out, helped us uh, um, to argue these folds could be active right now in the present time. So that's why Cayambe and Chingal Fault and Sumaco Fault and Cascade Faults, also with their Aventador Faults, but it's a more local uh, tectonic uh, structure. But th that's why these, those are three faults are taken in account for um, develop our uh, model and try to simulate um, movements of these faults to see the effects on the air of, on the Arventador volcano. And uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, the outcrops were not were not better um, highlighted uh, because uh, the because the situation in Ecuador is very very tough. There's a lot of vegetation, vegetation cover pretty much everything. And just because this new road uh, is created, we, have the po we had the possibility to find out these new traces because the only, the only evidence we had uh, were the evidence uh, were found uh, like 20, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So that's helped us a lot to uh, decide which faults are better to consider to try to simulate other possible future scenarios. Thanks. Follow up on that one? Sure. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, this is, uh, the, the Kula modeling might fit in well with your field mapping if you use the uh, the mapped features, these very young features, to sort of validate the uh, stress changes that you see with modeling. Have you considered that or tried to try to do that in any way? Uh, so rather than yeah. just look at the Coulomb modeling for the, the effects on the volcano, the, but to look at how it affects these other faults that you've mapped. Yeah, I could, mm, I want to try to do that, but um, the, the data uh, we had about all the faults uh, were incomplete or not to be not so specific to uh, help us uh, very well to define uh, which is the role of um, of every single fault on the other faults when the movement starts in, starts again um, in this part uh, in this area of Ecuador. So. Um, I was trying, but I decided to not take it in account because uh, since this uh, modeling was based on uh, hypotheses and incomplete, incomplete data set, I prefer to maintain the work more simplistic because in this way I could explain better um, what I want to highlight in this particular situation. So um, what I mean is uh, the, um, the opposite um, result um, on uh, the magmatic activity of a Ventador volcano, despite what we expect, uh, like it, for example, for, from this example in, by Walter and Amelung treating the Chilean uh, um, erupt eruptive events after a big Earthquake occurred there. So I've got another question. So um, your your main hypothesis seems to be that uh, the 1987 earthquake um, prevented an eruption that might otherwise have occurred. Um, but is that? Do you think that is sort of a specific? You know, the the earthquake was at a specific depth that caused that prevention of that uh, eruption. Yeah. One of the problem, one of the problem was uh, try to infer the position of the, the, the deepest magma reservoir because um, I right. didn't find any authors uh, talking about that, but just suppose a magma mixing uh, 
mm, from the analysis of the minerals contained in the lava flows uh, in the more specific um, the olivine and pyroxene uh, uh, in those lava flows um, seems to have um, a particular and unique uh, characteristic um, here the respect uh, other uh, situ other similar situation uh, that's why uh, in my future in my future goal I try to in I try to mm, I want to try to define better uh, which is the exactly position of this deeper reservoir because this uh, this particular characteristic could be move uh, a lot uh, the results of this uh, modeling because if we have for example a deeper reservoir more close to the dilatation area in red here respect yeah. to have this reservoir here uh, this model can could not fit uh, very well uh, the results but um, and at the main time, at the same time, if we if this deeper reservoir is more deep than 30 kilometers, we couldn't we couldn't know just with this uh, analysis, uh, which is the real effect of this earthquake on that deeper reservoir. So again, we are we can link we can separate uh, the consideration, but um, I discuss uh, with. Uh, uh, other professor and uh, other colleague and about mm, what they thinking about the, about this uh, this mechanism of uh, uh, ascending of hydrous magma from the from a deeper reservoir and they suggest me to to put this uh, magmatic chamber pretty much at 30 kilometers beneath the surface so that's why I Positioning the the smallest and deeper reservoir there, because the the presence of this particular mineral and um, um, water content of the magma could be explained with a deeper reservoir concentrated there. Could you, could you just uh, maybe mention some other techniques that could be used to estimate the depth of the reservoir? Um, uh, I think uh, I think one of the one of the best I know is the seismology. So maybe with um, a right. good array and um, a lot of instruments, we could mm, try to analyze uh, the movement of the magma or the gas. Uh, beneath the surface and try to figure it out which is the um, which is the source of the volcano tectonic seismicity and then try to define uh, the position of this um, of this two magmatic reservoir or maybe we could analyze ashes or other pyroclastic flows or I don't know maybe the dikes could help more than uh, the lava flow maybe if we found some regional dikes uh, and then we can collect uh, samples from there and then analyzing in detail maybe we have a clear story and mm, about the these def uh, the deformation the uh yeah, and about the deformation and about the, 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 the chemical deformation. the chemical product uh, of the present here at the Reventador volcano. So there haven't been any detailed uh, volcano seismology studies here, where you, I mean, looking at the distribution of seismicity with depth or anything. Or uh, uh, yeah. yeah, we try to we try to we started to analyze some seismic signals. Uh, Gently furnished by the Ecuadorian Observatory, but it was um, 
For first, uh, we don't we doesn't have uh, um, the um, the seismicity the seismicity of uh, 1987 uh, year. <laughs> so we have just to try to do that with uh, all the new information since the 2009 to 2011. But it was a very big data set and. Uh, Sub Greg knows that <laughs> it was subdivi subdivided in uh, very small pieces and the analysis uh, through these signals can become very, 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 very long. So I decided to, to take that just for an eventual future work. Right. Any questions from over there in Milan? Or? Well, Greg and Bill, do you have questions? Or, or I give a question? Uh, I, get, I don't have any more uh, real specific questions right now. I, what, I, one of the things I'm concerned about is the depth of the magma chamber and how that affects the interpretation. Because as Simon pointed out, um, uh, there are a lot of uncertainties, uh, there's a large uncertainty in the depth of the magma chamber or chambers, we, you know, we don't know the uh, depth extent of the magmatic system. So I think it's worth anyway um, pointing out this uncertainty in a little more detail and perhaps um, describing a bit the sensitivity of your modeling to and your interpretation to um, the various possible depths for the magma chamber. Because um, you could have yeah. completely different, it seems you can have completely different uh, outcome depending on whether your you know, magma chamber is at eight kilometers depth or 20 kilometers depth or. Yeah, and it's, yeah of course. Yeah, it, that, it, it was a problem I tried to solve uh, uh, so many times, but I didn't find anything could help me out to um, to be more specific with this, uh, with this proportion, with this distance between the two magmatic chamber, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have the, I don't have, the, I don't have way to, to focus this work, to focus my work on that because uh, when I try to, when I try to speak with Samaniego about this uh, interpretation. Um, his answer for was um, like the like the paper. So we didn't they didn't define this uh, the depth of this uh, recharger. So and I don't know how to could uh, infer in more detail like this. I just can try to speak with the other colleagues and professionals about this, but that's only what I carried out from that. And I think um, I think there is a possibility to study well, to study better this, uh, this situation. I mean, there is a lot of double magma chamber volcano, so of course there is the, te the techniques to analyze this problem. But obviously, the model is a uh, a lot is a lot sensitive of uh, this uh, about this characteristic. I mean, this is the supposition I did, and uh, this is just a starting point to try to figure it out, which is the best uh, developing way for this uh, for this problematic. Bill, do you have some question or comment? Uh, no, uh, not at this time. Okay. So I, can I give a question? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, just, just linking with this discussion, with this part of the discussion, um, Daniele presented uh, quickly different 
uh, scenarios um, analyzing the different folds, the different active folds that there are there. And of course, when you analyze the results of the reverse folds, the results are like this one, in the sense that at different depth you can have contraction or extension due to the earthquakes. And so this makes the problem uh, very important regarding the depth of the magma chamber. But there is also the other solution regarding the stack slip fault, and the solution of the stack slip fault is independent from the depth of the magma chamber. Can you comment, please? I speak about the Chingwald fault. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we have. Uh, First of the three slides. This one. This one. Yeah, uh, here and the Chingal and the Chingal folds, uh, we see the, the strike slip fold um, could in fact um, act uh, at um, the opposite respect, the Aventador folds or Sumatra folds, and. Uh, Mm. The problem is uh, mm, there. Mm, the results given uh, from this um, from the analysis of these folds uh, was not to not so good to mm, taking it in account for. Mm, to constrict the analysis of the interaction between the mm, between the tectonic and the volcanic. Why? Because um, uh, the supposed idea was um, all these poles have just a strike slip component. Uh, with a mm, have a minor size lift component respect the reverse component. So mm, it's I assume that more probably um, movement of these folds is the reverse is the thrusting uh, with an oblique com, with an oblique. Um, In a, with an oblique uh, added movement. movement. So um, I think is more um, But this model is done with strike slip movement, this model. This model is due by strike slip movement and uh, reverse movement both. So on the left you have the reverse movement and on the right you have the the strike slip movement. But they are not very different. They are not very different because the movement assume uh, in the um, in the modeling is just one. So and uh, you could act just only a strike slip component or a reverse component. And in this case they are pretty similar but um, for example, as you see here, the two uh, analyses are completely different. I mean, what I mean is, uh, um, for the reverse component, we have a minor, a minor increases of the of the normal stress change, despite for the um, increasing of the normal stress change due by um, oh, the opposite. Sorry, at the reverse component, we have a minor um, increasing of the normal stress change than for the for the strike slip, like evidence here. But the other um, the other thing um, I used to not consider um, this fault uh, so Linked with the magmatic activity of Air Aventador is because um, they acting not so deep to reach the magmatic chamber. So they acting more superficial than the um, 
than the trust movement of the 5th uh, March 1987 earthquake. So the normal stress change could uh, involve the volcano edifice, but probably not in interact the magma chamber. But these uh, values representing the claim for unclaimed, in which depth uh, they are projected? I mean, when, when this light, uh, this The unclamping value, is positive. No, no, but these values, in which depth they are projected? At the surface or at a certain depth? This is what happened at a certain depth and... Uh, but do you remember which is the depth? Do you remember which is the depth here? Yeah, here they reached uh, uh, mm, three kilometers depth. This is three kilometers depth. Three kilometers depth. Mm -hmm. And uh, because when I tried to... When I tried to move these folds more deeper, uh, they didn't have uh, any um, relative important uh, solution. Mm -hmm. So I tried to... So you mean that also in this case, the depth of the magma chamber is important because there's a freezing of these values in any exactly. case of depth? Exactly. And uh, another thing is uh, all of these folds, except for the 5th uh, March 1987 earthquake, are the superficial expression of the folds. And we don't have uh, the exactly ending of these folds beneath the surface. So I just give the calculation to the software, and I saw the movement could reach just only three kilometers there. So the interaction with the magmatic chamber doesn't exist for these folds. And then uh, that's why uh, I, I already said uh, the two phenomena are completely dissociated because the eruptive history of the Reventador volcano still continue by his, um, by his weight and uh, the tectonic behavior of these four are independent. So, Uh, other questions for your side? Uh, just to follow up on this quickly, the, um, how confident are you in the geometry of the conduit here? Because that's very important when you're trying to calculate whether there's the, what the normal stress change is. So what did you use to determine the orientation of or the, and the geometry of the conduit in the shallow subsurface? Yeah. Um, for the orientation of the folds and the uh, extension and the position of the folds, I used uh, the catalog uh, furnished me by Alessandro. Um, no, but what about the magmatic conduit? Oh, the magmatic conduit? Sorry, Greg, can, could you please repeat me the question? Because I didn't know it very well. The, you, you calculate a normal stress change. Um, what, 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 what is that based on? You're using a, a plane or some kind of uh, feature to calculate the stress change on, I presume. And what, uh, what is the orientation of that? So for example, are you calculating it for uh, a planar feature like a dike beneath the volcano or? Oh, no, 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 no. It was just uh, uh, applied for faults beneath the volcano and surrounded the volcano. So, um, just because I didn't have information about the dikes and because I didn't find any traces of that, um, I didn't try to use it these faults like dikes because uh, they are clearly um, they are clearly dissociated from the from the volcano. What I mean is, uh, mm, if I knew the position of some dikes. Uh, beneath or surrounding the volcano, I could uh, mm, elaborate this model, uh, treat the feature like dikes, and see um, how uh, they affect the edifice and the magmatic chamber of this volcano. I don't know if I answered okay. your question. But More, Simon? Um, I think so.
Okay, I guess we're we're through ans uh, asking questions here. So if you have some more there, or no, no, no more questions. What happens now? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit different so we, in the U.S., I think. So we, we can go through the evaluation now. Yeah, so I have to ask you to wait some minutes because I have to invite people to leave the room and to interrupt the streaming connection. So just give me a few minutes, okay? Okay. Yeah, you want, sure. All right. Okay, okay guys. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Simon. I hope you enjoy the presentation.
Quindi mi avvisate quando è quando siamo di nuovo in streaming, eccetera, che io ho anche loro. È già, è già tutto pronto? Sì. Cioè siamo già in streaming. Ok, Simon, Greg, we are ready again. So okay. Daniel is here, and so he give you. So Daniela, uh, congratulations. We voted to uh, pass the, you on the oral uh, examination. Thank um, you. And, um, but, but we do have some uh, recommendations for improving the written manuscript. So uh, we'll be uh, sending, I guess we'll just send you by email some specific things to, to correct with the report. And then you'll be done. All right, okay. Yeah, congratulations. We, we understand it's a very challenging place to work in the, in the field work, especially. And, uh, Thank you. <laughs> you've done a lot of work. You just need to, I think, better express or better um, yeah, describe the work you did in the, in the thesis. So we need, I guess we'll have some, uh, we'll send you some suggestions for that. Um. All right. OK, so let's uh, applaud. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much, Greg, for everything you do, you did, you do, for helping me to carry out this, uh, these results and this work, because it was very tough. And we speak a lot about all the things uh, and uh, try to find out uh, how to link it uh, between. And uh, thank you very much, very, very much. Thank you. And thank you, Simon, for to be my co-advisor co and uh, for a question you give me because in this way I have a way to explain what I was thinking about this work and why I decided to put myself in this challenge. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Nice thank job. you, Simon. Greg, thank you. So we can close the connection and Goodbye, we will keep in touch by email, okay? Okay, sounds good. All right, ciao. Bye-bye. Thank you.